Welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and leading figures from the world of football talk about their first ever match they attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's guest, John Champion. You'll all recognise John's voice from com- commentaries over the decades. And John started with BBC Sport back in the late 1980s and was one of the first commentary, uh, main commentary on BBC Five Live Sport when it launched in 1994. And then moved on to television commentary with Match of the Day, ITV, uh, whom he has also covered quite a few World Cups recently uh, and forming a formidable partnership with Ali McCoist. John also works at ESPN and NBC in the US. So, great to have you on board, John. Can't wait to delve into your first game, which, like your fellow commentator and also a guest on this pod, Guy Mowbray, was at Bootham Crescent. It was, yes. Um, And it was on the 7th of January, 1978. I was 12. And it was a game in the fourth division against Newport County. It was not in any way glamorous. York won it, which made it remarkable for the time because they didn't win many games at all. In fact, I think that season they ended up for the umpteenth time having to apply for re-election at a time Mm -hmm. when the bottom four all had to go cap in hand to the Football League and to the constituent clubs and say, please, can we have another chance? Well, York did that on an annual basis. Uh, And yet, having said that, they were only three years on from having been playing in the second tier. They, they'd yeah. had two seasons in the old second division, now the championship. Remarkably, really, that they'd reached that high. Um, fairly extraordinary that they survived more than one season. But they had a manager that took over called Wilf McGuinness, who would be best known, really, for his time at, at Manchester United. Course, uh, yeah. And he promised to get them out of the second division. And he was absolutely right. They went straight through the third and into the fourth. And by the time I picked them up at the age of 12, they were really struggling. They were down on their heels. If if I remember rightly, the crowd, I think, was 1,971 for this game that that I saw against Newport County. Uh, And yet it was the event that captivated me. Um, It grasped me in a way that nothing else in life ever had. Finally being able to go and watch a football match at the nearby ground. Because for years, I, I, I was... Born and brought up in that region. I was born in Harrogate, only because my mother's best friend was a midwife at Harrogate Hospital. But my parents lived in York. So at a day old, I was back in York. And that's where I grew up. It's where my mother still lives. Um, and uh, and so York City was always going to be my team, uh, despite the, the comparative glamour of Leeds United down the road. Le- Leeds was the team that many locals followed at the, at the time. But York City was always going to be the side for me. And I I suffered the anguish, really, of having an upbringing with two parents who were both teachers and wanted me to be the the perfect scholar and also a musician. They had great designs on me playing in a concert at the Albert Hall or something like that. That seemed to sustain them in in terms of what they sent me to do. So rather than allowing me to go off and watch the football on a Saturday, I would have to go to orchestra practice and have music lessons and things like this, which was the last thing I wanted to do, particularly as our house was about five minutes walk from the front gates of Booth and Crescent. So on a Saturday afternoon, when I was just going off to orchestra practice for three hours, I could hear the crowd roaring. And I could see all these people walking past our front door, heading off to Booth and Crescent, wearing their scarves and singing and chatting in animated fashion about the the afternoon's game. And I wanted to be part of that. I didn't want to be second violin. I wanted to be on the Shipton Street end behind the goal. Um, All the more so as... To add to the sense of anguish, Richard, um, my school, Shipton Street Infant School, actually backed on to the football ground. So (laughs) I'd been there many times, usually to get our our ball back at playground, uh, at playtime after the ball had gone over the wall that separated my school playground from the football ground. And then we get chased out by the groundsman. So I'd been in there. So I, I knew what it looked like, but I'd never felt what it was actually like until one day. Um, a friend of my dad's came round for lunch on a Saturday. And for once, it was a day without wretched orchestra practice. Um, And I knew that he was going to the game. And I'd harangued my parents for years to allow me to go to the football. And they'd always firmly said no. Um, 
But I knew this chat was going, so I made a real nuisance of myself as we sat and had lunch that day and made it very, very clear that I wanted to go to the football. And eventually, as I hoped he would, he said, oh, well, I'll, I'll take you this afternoon. Why don't you come? And my parents had no answer to that because they couldn't find a reason why I couldn't go. So off we went. And that that was it, really. Um, we walked down Bootham, turned right down Bootham Crescent. Bootham was my home address. Bootham Crescent was a road off it. Walked round this crescent of houses and suddenly was presented with this swarm of people. I know the crowd was only 1,971, <laughs> but it felt like 10, 15,000 people. And through the gates we went. And I remember the formative experiences of, first of all, walking past the back of the main stand. And it was, it was a fairly rudimentary stand. So you could actually see the dressing room windows and you could smell the liniment that they were rubbing. Oh. All the players were rubbing into their legs. Uh, yeah. sort of Ralgex or something like that. That was it was a really vivid smell. And I remember that. And then I remember the smell of the Bovril from the refreshment stand as we were queuing to go it in through the, the turnstiles. And I remember handing over the money. It was about a pound, I think, to go in. And the click of the turnstiles as we went through. And then we were into this uh area where I'd never been allowed to go on a, on a day when it was actually in operation. The ground itself, you could see the pitch, you could see the stand, and you could see this vast, it seemed vast, open terrace behind the goal, the Shipton Street end, behind which was my old school. And we went and took our position there, and I went many times subsequently where it was quite difficult to find my usual spot because there were so many people in better times for York, but that day we could virtually pick our own position and we stood right behind the goal and the game kicked off and I was captivated even before the game had started to be honest this was something I'd never thought that I would experience and finally to get into Bootham Crescent and be there to watch the local team it was um it was magic yeah I I I actually uh asked Paul Bowser I'm sure you know very well uh the club historian to help me with some of the details because my knowledge of York is not as uh, profound as yours uh and he he's done this before with with Guy Mowbray uh he helped me and provided me with some press cuttings which are great and uh, you will also know of Malcolm Huntington, who is the local reporter who covered York for many, many years. Yeah, and, and just to interrupt me, Richard, just to say, Malcolm Huntington was the York reporter for many, many years, and I used to read him and think I'd love to do his job, and that was my first interest in, in journalism. But he had a greater claim to fame, and I don't know whether Paul told but Malcolm well, Huntington... Guy, Guy has mentioned this as ah, well, the, the tennis right. umpire with John well, McEnroe. Yeah, the world's foremost tennis umpire. He used to travel the world when he wasn't reporting on, on York City, an umpire at the main events. And he was the man at, at whom McEnroe shouted, you cannot be serious. Yeah. Um, and he traded off that at dinners for many years. I'm sure, I'm sure. If he if he was around today, maybe he'd be doing a podcast called You Cannot Be Serious. But um, <laughs> on, in the press, uh, there is a letter to the sports editor, because we're going back to the idea that there were only 1,971 people there. Yes. It said, having had the pleasure of watching York City for 18 years, I must voice both my disappointment and disgust at the size of the crowd for Saturday's game against Newport County. Surely now is the time to get right behind the side and support the team that is playing football far above its position in the league would suggest. Come on, all you so-called supporters. Let's see what you're made of. Give Charlie Wright and his team all the encouragement you can. And I would like to wish Charlie Wright a long and happy spell with York City. And this is the best bit. And let's hope he sees a gate of 10,000 for the Watford game. He and the team deserve it. Mr. N. Collison and actually give his address to Station Houses, Stockton on Forest. Now, <laughs> unfortunately for Mr. Collinson, I looked up the gate for the Watford game, which followed two weeks afterwards, and unfortunately Watford won 4-0. The gate was actually 4,001, so it didn't quite make the 10,000, but it was the highest league gate of the season for York. So... What I also are really interested in is quite a lot of people, their first match is not a big match. So the fact you're going with only 2,000 people, which, as you say, feels like 50,000 people when you're 12. 
it's got more of an intimacy about it. So, you know, if, you know, maybe current fans, they go to their first game at the Tottenham Stadium and it's 60-odd thousand, this feels, in a way, more real. And you, you, you I think you, you're more likely to make a connection with the club and the spectators and the turnstile operator and all that sort of thing. Did, did you, you said you got it. Do you think that's true? I think it probably is. It's a much more personal experience because if you're one of 2,000 people, um, you get the chance to to look around, to take the, the spectacle in. There are spaces, there are gaps, rather than just a mass of humanity. If you walk into your first game, to give your example, at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium with 62,000 people, I think you're probably wowed by the architecture and the atmosphere. But I think there are other things to grab you if you, if you go to a, a small ground with a relatively small crowd. So I think that's why the experiences I had that day are still so vividly in my mind. And I can still I can still smell the Bovril and I can still smell the liniment coming part, past the back of the main stand. So... I think those are things that you don't get at one of these vast new spaceships that are wonderful in their own way, mm -hmm. um, but they're less personal. Um, and I think for so many other reasons, because I was a York boy, because I'd been to school just, um, well, less than a goal kick away from the ground, because I could hear the ground and the crowd on a Saturday afternoon from my back garden and yet wasn't allowed to go there for so long. I think these are all reasons why this was such a... An explosive experience, really. Um, mm. it, it just opened up a world that I thought was going to be denied to me. And I, I also didn't realise what that world was like. I thought I knew what it would be like. But until I actually went and was captivated by the whole experience, I had no idea, really. Yeah. And can you remember details of the match? Because, you know, the embrication and the bovril is just the background. <laughs> it to is. What went it on is. the pitch. The match was... Uh, <sighs> unremarkable um i mean i can remember the goal scorers uh, it was a chap called peter scott who was a rarity in that he was a full international playing for york at the time he played for everton okay and had won i think 10 caps for northern ireland so that made him wildly exotic in the view yes. of a 12 year old from york that someone had a played in the top division for a club that other people had heard of b was an international and c came from northern ireland I mean, that yes. ticked all the boxes. This was like someone who'd come from the Antipodes to play, mm. or we might as well have done. Um, I mean, other names that that grabbed me, and I remember watching Gordon Staniford, who played on the wing. He scored a penalty to, to confirm our marvellous 2-0 victory. He went on to play in an FA Cup semi-final for Plymouth Argyle. His daughter, Lucy, is an England women's international to this day. And Gordon, I got to know very well when I became a, a broadcaster in a later life. A, a lovely chap. Wonderfully talented, a jinking winger, to use the terminology of the times. Um, so he was another one that I, I remember watching. But the one player that really grabbed me, actually, was was the right winger, who was a young chap called Jan Novaki. I'm probably mm. pronouncing that completely wrong. He was from Manchester, but clearly his yes. surname wasn't originally. And he was on loan from Bolton Wanderers. And he was a flyer. And if I'd been asked to name one of those York players who had a real chance of making a career in the game that day, it would have been Jan Novaki. And I think ultimately he went back from his loan spell to Bolton, didn't play much and faded out of the game, sadly. Um, so, so he was one. Uh, I was aware that Steve James, the centre-back, had played for Manchester United. So mm -hmm. that was quite sexy. Um, yeah. and, and one of the, um, the other things that I remember, uh, Kevin Randall, the, the striker, yes. was a lower league journeyman. I mean, Kevin's no longer with us, sadly. He became... Um, the assistant manager of Chesterfield. So later in my career, I commentated on Chesterfield's valiant attempt to win an FA Cup semi-final, the disallowed yes. goal at Old Trafford, which VAR, of yeah, course, yeah. would have corrected. I hate VAR. I also hate yes. the fact that Chesterfield didn't make the Cup final. Um, mm. I, you know, that's that's a, a, the eternal dilemma now, whether we, we like VAR or not. But Chesterfield had their great day and Kevin was the assistant manager. He was the striker that day. I remember he couldn't run. It was very late in his career. Um, right. He was not particularly mobile, but he knew where the goal was. And the biggest, my biggest takeaway from the actual game was York's goalkeeper, a chap called Graham Brown, another mm -hmm. player who'd probably got 500 league matches under his belt at that stage. Um, he was from Mansfield. Um, he was exotic as well because he'd had a spell in the old NASL playing against Pele for the Portland wow. Timbers. 
Wow. Uh, and of course, another aspect of my career was pitching up to work for the ESPN, doing Major League Soccer for five years and going to Portland and being able to talk to people who remember Graham Brown. But I'm sorry, I'm waffling here. And maybe that's... No, no, no. We, we uh, love waffling. To allow waffling. waffling. But Graham Brown was most notable in my mind because he could barely kick the ball beyond his own penalty area. Really? So he'd be absolutely useless as a modern goalkeeper where you're required oh, yeah. to be like Edison and be able to kick yeah. it 120 yards. Mm-hmm. He could barely make it 18 yards. So, um, you know, every goal kick was inviting pressure from the opposition because he just couldn't kick it very far. Yeah, as you say, he probably wouldn't have been a great sweeper-keeper or keeper-sweeper, whichever way. No, no. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that is, that's a pretty good... Um, memory of those players because a lot of people I have on this pod literally cannot remember one thing about the game and hardly the lineups but that maybe this is where your career was already set in stone that you weren't going to become the great musician that your parents <laughs> hoping you were going to be but you actually turned into you know a legendary broadcaster and you keep detail Maybe I that, suppose that I, I suppose that... I do. I suppose I do. I mean, in fairness to Newport County, if there are any Newport County fans listening to this and thinking, well, we got beaten at York that day and John only remembers York. Um, there was one player that captured my imagination for Newport as well. A chap called Brian Clark. And um, mm-hmm. the reason that that he was notable was that earlier in his career, he'd scored a winning goal against Real Madrid for Cardiff City in a Cup Winners' Cup quarterfinal, wow. first leg tie at Ninian Park. And this was, inevitably, you're getting the picture here that a lot of the players were either very young trying to make their way in the game or very old and on their way to Mm -hmm. retirement. And Brian Clark was in that category. But it was quite thrilling to see someone who'd actually scored the winning goal against Real Madrid in a European competition playing at Booth and Crescent. We had to feed off those things in the the early years because there wasn't a lot of glamour around. Um, And for that reason, uh, without deviating too far from this game, before long, uh, as I was becoming more and more of a fan and going to every home game, I'd finally shrugged off the notion of orchestra practice and music lessons uh, and s- travelling to some away games on the on the bus as well, which was a, a huge thrill. Um, York signed Peter Lorimer. Yes. The man with the hottest shot in football, Mr. 90 miles an hour. And if you were to ask me for my clearest memory of watching football at Bootham Crescent, and this includes being a broadcaster and seeing them beat Arsenal in the Cup and mm-hmm. knock Manchester United out of the League Cup, doing the radio commentary that night and two games, two draws against Liverpool. Um, my clearest memory would be standing as a 13-year-old behind the Shipton Street goal, dis- right behind the goal, for a game against Port Vale when Peter Lorimer let fly with a free kick from 25 yards. And it travelled so fast, straight towards my forehead, that it actually removed the net from its rigging. And that was Mr. 90 miles an hour made real to a a York fan who'd watched him play in the all-conquering lead side and score these spectacular goals for which he was world-renowned. And then he did it. It almost felt like he'd done it for me that day. And that that is my clearest childhood football memory of this Lorimer free kick arrowing towards my forehead and taking the net off its stanchion. Yeah, funny enough, Guy Mowbray saw Peter Lorimer's debut, uh, and um, in the in the local press again under Malcolm, Malcolm Hunterton, Lorimer was thunderfoot, mm. and as we know, we saw hundreds of uh, examples of that for Leeds, and obviously you saw close up a very good example of it at York. Um, he didn't last that long, did he? I think he was there just for a, a season but, towards the end of his career. He, I think he played 29 games for York, but strangely, right. he then went back to Leeds and played That's for right. them again for some yeah. for some considerable time. So the, I mean, pretty much the age of 40. Exactly. And it, I remember looking at this and he actually overtook John Charles's appearance record at Leeds. He, he was just short of it when he moved to York. And then I think he went to the States, actually, funnily enough, for a little bit. And yeah. then returned to your, uh, to Leeds and took the appearance record by a long way. So, I mean, everyone everyone needs to stop at York in their career to to have that badge of honour, don't they? Yeah. I wish a few more of his ilk had stopped at York through the years. Richard, <laughs> we 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 coveted those who decided to to do so. Indeed. 
Um, and one of the aspects of Newport, uh, as you say, I hope we have some um, listeners from South Wales uh, for this episode, was the manager for Newport, who was Colin Addison. Mm. Now, Colin Addison had actually, again, on thanks to Paul Bowser for this, but apparently he he had played for York, and he played his last game for York as a player 17 years ago to the day that you watched your first match. And in fact, that was his last match as Newport manager because he then went to West Brom with Ron Atkinson. Uh, and I also like the fact that if we're thinking about Colin Addison, he ended up at Hereford mm. and scored the equaliser at St. James's Park that led to probably the most famous FA Cup replay ever. Unfortunately, as we know recently, FA Cup replays have been banished to a bin. And again, we don't need to go into the the, the storm behind that. We're not going to go into VAR. We're not going to go into banishing FA Cup replays. But it's... I love the links football give you. I love the cyclical nature of it and the circular. You know, there's always something that is a link into the team, whether they played for them, whether they appeared for them. And and I just, it just builds up a, a, a picture of a history that is connected. And, you know, that's the great thing about players moving. They move and then they come back. And then, you know, that gives you a fantastic background I think and then as you know you're a broadcaster I'm a journalist we love fact we love those little nuggets of information and that's often what keeps us going so you know you were set off on your journey you remember half the team which is very impressive but beyond that there, there are all these things that you learn about and you know I'm sure you raced back home and started reading up about you know, York's next game and, you know, how you're going to get involved. You did say there that you then went pretty regularly. Was that quite soon after that first yeah. game? Did you manage it, it to throw was. the orchestra thing off? I, I did. It, I, it was one of my greatest childhood achievements, really, managing to win <laughs> the orchestra practice. Um, so, yes, I was going... I mean, that Watford game that you referred to, I remember going to that. Right. Um and that, I think, was significant because York had sold a very good winger called Brian Pollard to Watford. Mm -hmm. And it was his first return, I think. And that was that was when Watford were just starting their surge through the through the divisions. Um, so Watford was actually quite a big game, which is why we had as many as 4,000 people there. Yes. They were the, yes. the glamour side of the fourth division that year. And I believe Luther Blissett actually scored for Watford that day. And he Alan did. May's got a hat trick. Um, yes, yes. Just on Colin Addison, you know, you, yes. you mentioned uh, wheels within wheels. If I tell you that I'm also a big cricket fan, and although I'm a Yorkshireman and Yorkshire would be my county, I, I got to New Road, Worcester, because it's the closest first cast ground to, to home. Um, and quite often, even in this day and age, I'll get a tap on the shoulder when I sit behind the boulder's arm and I'll turn round and it'll be a gentleman who is now round about 80 and looks about 60 saying, John, how are you? And we'll talk about cricket and football. And that's Colin Addison. No way. No, really? he still lives in Hereford, still goes to watch Hereford. Um, magnificent football figure. And uh, and just one of the great men. And so many, you know, having managed Atletico Madrid yes. under the, the legendary Jesus Hill, um, he's got so many fantastic stories. Uh, and of course, the, the Hereford experiences as well. Um, and through my career, I've been lucky enough to go and do a, a few cup ties at Hereford and obviously bumped into him there. And when um, when Ronnie Radford was was around, he would he would yeah. be there. And, and one of my broadcasting mentors at the BBC when I came through a match of the day was John Motson, who on an annual basis was invited back for reunions to to remember that great game against Newcastle. So that whole Hereford set, I, I kind of got to know. But Colin Addison is a is a a friend and acquaintance to this day at the cricket. Well, that, as you say, the wheels within wheels, it's, it's all there. It's, it's fantastic. You mentioned John Motson. <clears throat> Again, the commentary to the Hereford game is something that I think 
people of our generation, let's say, it's mm-hmm. it's here, it's instilled. Just shifting forward a little bit, and we will go back and forward. Has there ever been a moment where in your commentary career you just captured something and people go, you absolutely nailed that? Is there something where you went, yeah, that that was the perfect phrase, the perfect time, the perfect commentary? Yeah, I don't think such a thing exists, Richard. I I think you can pick fault in anything. I mean, the ultimate line of commentary is Kenneth Wollstonehome Mm. when England won the, the cup final, certainly for people in this country. And it, I mean, it's magnificent and it's certainly stood the test of time and there's no way he could have planned it. And that made it all the better. Um, but there's a bit of hesitation as he delivers that. And I think if I'd done that line, I'd probably been kicking myself for not delivering it more cleanly on the way home. Well, goodness me, it's the last thing you need to be worried about if England have just won the World Cup and you have produced that line. I suppose you get people that quote things back to you. Um mm. Uh, and that probably is proof that they've stood the test of time and maybe they captured the moment. Um, I get a lot of people that um, quote back to me a line about Thierry Henry when he came back to Arsenal Mm -hmm. and um, he played in a cup tie against Leeds United. I think it was on a Monday night at the Emirates. And um, it 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 was his first, I think it was his first game back and he scored a very significant, in fact, match-winning goal. And it was a classic Henri goal. But, you know, he was a little bit older and a little bit slower than he had been. And this was an echo of the past. And um, it was on the night that they unveiled his statue outside the ground. Mm-hmm. So I can't quite remember what it was. But it, it was I worked some sort of line in about um, he may be cast in bronze, but he's still capable of producing truly golden moments. And that's right. a line that I get quoted back to me quite a bit. I mean, there have been other other games and other bigger goals, um, and, and people throw those lines back at me from time to time, um, you know, in World Cups and mm-hmm. Champions League and clinching goals in league titles. Um, but, but that's the one that I quite like, because I had no idea when it, the ball hit the net what I was going to say. And then right. it just struck me, crikey, this bloke's just had a statue unveiled tonight. That doesn't happen very often. And it just came into my head. So I, I suppose that that would be up there for me. OK, we're going to zip back to uh, your game, your first game. Um, and this is something that always, it, it's a subject that people love to talk about, kids. Hmm. So York, Guy Mowbray said that he just missed the famous wide kit. I am I right in thinking that they were wearing the wide kit maroon and white in your game, or is that just um, some sort of historical fudging? And and uh, say it's a kit that I love, and I, I've never watched York live, but I know it. So yes. were they wearing that one? I just missed it. They moved into ah. some combo of red and blue. Um, which is the basis of what they wear today. Yes. Um, so so I, I did miss it, although I'd seen it on the television so many times, the maroon white kit. I mean, how wonderful yeah. was that to be as yeah. individualistic as, as that? I mean, whoever designed it was genius, really, because it got yeah. York more attention than just about anything else for a long time because they wore this outlandish strip. But sadly, um, I have no memory of them wearing it that day. My only memories of watching them in those early years are of them wearing the the red, predominantly red with blue trim. Yeah, which is also a nice kit, but it's not iconic. And it's not unique because that Y kit is unique and, and not and many the, teams could, and the, could the wear it. The club was based on a, a, a stylized Y at the time as well, which was great. And they binned that at the same time as they changed the kit. I think there was a move to try and get away from this period of the club, which ultimately was seen, it should have been seen as a great success because they got up into the top half of the league structure for two seasons. Um, But because of the way they then fell through the divisions, I think there was a move to try and turn the page um, and create a a new image. Uh, And I'm not sure it was the right call, but that was the thinking. Yeah, because you say this... This season, unfortunately, didn't end that well. I mean, the the Newport victory was the third successive home league victory, and mm-hmm. 
celebrated in the local press as though you'd won the FA Cup final. Um, so slim pickings, but, you know, you, you have I mean, to you, take... You, you say it didn't end that game. well. We actually finished 22nd. Now, compared to yeah. some other seasons, that was pretty good. There were only 24 yeah. teams in that league, but 22nd was better than it could have been. Indeed, and he finished just above a team called Wimbledon. Mm. Yeah, whatever happened to them. And we know we know what happened to them. Um, so, again, I like to go into the details because I think this is the most important part of this poll and the most interesting part. So, Booth and Crescent, you, you know, your school backed onto it. You were very, you lived very close. What other memories do you have? And, and Guy Mowbray talks about the catering cart and the burgers and, you know, Shipton Street. Uh, did you always go to the Shipton Street end or were you one of those people who moved around? I mean, I tried moving around, but quickly gravitated back to the Shipton Street end, not least because you had to pay a transfer. If you wanted to go um, into other areas of the ground from the Shipton Street end, for which you paid basic admission, you'd have to pay another 20p to go in what they called the popular stand, which was the low single decker stand opposite the main stand. So if it was pouring down with rain, bearing in mind the Shipton Street end at that stage was totally uncovered, there would be a, a, a certain pull to a seat under cover, but then the thought of having to pay what was probably a quarter of your week's pocket money to get there <laughs> put me off more often than not. And also the, the, the attraction of being behind the goal was was some if I, if I go and pay to watch a match now I'll always go behind the goal it, yeah. you know, even if I'm offered a nice seat in the main stand I will reject that and and go sadly not on standing terracing anymore by and large oh. unless it's a, a lower league occasion but um but yes that habit remains with me that I like watching from that that angle so I remember the transfer boxes they were little garden huts um spread around right. various places in the ground, which would be the point you'd go and pay your 20p or your 30p to transfer into a supposedly more superior part of the, the stadium. The stadium was very simple. Um, it was a, a main stand which had a paddock on, uh, on the, the ground level for standing and then mm -hmm. seats in the, the upper tier with a tiny press box and a small director's box and glass at each end, glass panels. It didn't run the full length of the pitch. It ran probably three quarters of the length of the pitch. The Shipton Street end was if you were in the main stand, you'd look to the right. And that was just an open concrete terrace going back with a church and my old school uh, clearly visible behind. The far end was the Grosvenor Road end, which was a slightly smaller open terrace, which was generally the, the, the visitors. And then opposite the main stand was this popular stand, which has been built with funds from the supporters in the early years of the ground. The ground, I think, was opened in 1932, which was three yeah. years after York had got into the football league. They played at a ground called Fulford Gate to start with for the first three years, and then they'd they'd moved to Bootham Crescent. And the great beauty of Bootham Crescent, apart from the fact it was it was where I learned to to watch football and have my formative experiences, was that it was only seven minutes walk from the absolute epicenter of York, from York Minster. So yeah. you could uh, go to the game, and then you had. I mean, York's famous for having 365 pubs and probably 200 of those were within, within walking distance of the ground. So it was a very convivial place to go and spend yeah. a day at the football for that reason. It was also easily walkable from the, the railway station for visiting supporters. So it had so many things going for it, but it had in the modern era, no corporate facilities. And yeah. I think it had 12 car park spaces, which were directly behind the main stand. And you yeah. always risked uh, a disgruntled supporter running a key down the side of the car because they had to funnel in through this car park, which was between a boundary wall and the back of the main stand, to get to the main turnstiles to to get in the, the stadium. Yes. So, uh, yeah, and if someone brought a big car, that would take out a couple of spaces. So yes. uh, facilities have improved by moving to the stadium. And again, this is something I spoke to Guy about is... You know, he had very fond memories of Booth and Crescent. And, you know, he, he actually mentioned, although they were in a round shackle state, the toilets, somehow he missed those, even though mm. they weren't of the standard that we'd expect at a no. ground nowadays. No, um, that, that would be fair. I mean, none of the facilities were of the standard you'd expect at a ground nowadays, but it had heart, soul and character and history. 
And mm. they, these are the imperceptible things that make a football ground for me. Yeah. Uh, and so, why, you know, you, we're talking a day after I was at the North London Derby and the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium is the most futuristic sports arena, I think, in the country. And it's magnificent. But as yet, it has no history. Um, and for that reason, it just feels a little clinical still to me. Um, and even some of the grounds that opened in the first wave of new stadiums 25, 30 years ago, they're a little bit like Meccano sets. Mm. You, know, you can't criticise them architecturally, except they lack character. And the fact that so many of those stadiums of yesteryear were built on an ad hoc basis with no overall plan, they were just developed bit by bit over the years, gave them a certain appeal. And I think there was no better example than that. When I moved south to work for the BBC, um, our first sort of family home that we bought was a little village near Oxford. So the Manor Ground was the local stadium we would yes. go to. And I think I'm right in saying they had either nine or ten different stands around the pitch at the Manor Ground. Uh, and that had so much character. Um, yeah. and, and I love those grounds. Uh, you know, Goodison. Uh, I, I know we're diverting here slightly, Richard, but no, no, I, no. I'll be so sad to see Goodison Park go because to me that is yeah. the, the last of the grand old football grounds, the last taste of how it always used to be. Yeah. Well, as a Palace fan, I still retain a, a love of Selhurst Park. I know it's not everyone's favourite ground, but it's still a bit rickety. It's still, it's not um, to the standard of your Tottenham Stadium or your Emirates or Etihad or wherever, but it's our ground. Yeah. I've seen... So many amazing games there, you know, Chris Bull, us getting promoted against Burnley, you know, all these things that are the great, us, I, I mean, probably the one that I remember clearest is when we beat Blackburn 3 0 in the second leg of the playoff final. And that yeah. was the most <clears throat> emotional I've ever been at a football match, I think, because it was just this wave of joy because we were finally going up. Um, and these things, as you say, if you move to a new stadium or if it gets redeveloped, they slightly move away. And, and as you say, you lose the soul and the spirit to a certain extent of what that stadium represented. Yeah. So Guy spoke about this as well, is that he said when York have clearly moved to the new stadium, that the morning for the booth, Booth and Crescent wasn't that severe because actually the new stadium was quite nice. Did you did you mourn the loss of Booth and Crescent? Uh, and I still do because I, of your close yeah. connections. Yeah, I still do. Um, I walked past the site the other day, and it's still a building site, although there are now flats oh. and houses on it, but they're not all entirely complete. So you can still see elements of the old boundary wall poking out at the back of the, the building site. I find it very sad really. I, I acknowledge that progress had to be made. And I've been to the new stadium a fair few times, and it is in its own way very nice, but it is soulless. And it's mm. it's on a, a shopping park, and it's three miles out of the city. And it just doesn't have the same appeal. It's interesting, though, what it does to the profile of the support of a club. And I've seen this at other clubs as well, but chatting to people that, that are at York City now, uh, behind the scenes, they explain that not only are crowds several multiples of what they were. I mean, 1,971 for that game that we saw in the fourth division. They've been uh, struggling in the National League this year. Their last yeah. two home games, 7,500 people, and they could have sold more tickets. And the age, the fascinating thing is the, the age profile is a lot lower than it ever used to be. So there's a whole mm -hmm. new generation of fans who find it attractive to go and watch their local football team that clearly didn't, even when they were an established football league side, however many years ago, 46 years ago.